My name is Sharon Wiggins. Okay, where are you from? Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You got family there? Well, I have aunts who, who still live there, but my, since I've been incarcerated, my mother lives in uh, Detroit, Michigan. Oh, yeah? Right. So you don't get to see her very often? No, about once a year. How long have you been in here? 24 years. So how old were you when you came in? When I came to Muncie, I was 18, 1969. Sixties and all that crazy stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, if you were, I mean, here's the hard question: If you were going to describe a life sentence to somebody that doesn't know anything about it, how would you do it? Uh, I guess if, I guess because we don't have a lot of time, um, if I was going to. Um, equated with something, I guess it would be like the feeling of it is sort of like being in a real dark room with uh, a blindfold on. So the room's dark and you have a blindfold on too. Right. So is there any light? I mean, does any light get through that blindfold in that dark room? Uh -uh. Not visual light, but I think what, what happens is that after a time, uh, your imagination or your mind um, creates uh, light for you. And so um, it's more of uh, what you're thinking that creates, you know, the kind of atmosphere that you have. And I think it's like being blind in a lot of ways, the sensation of it. Talk about that a little more. Like I said, the only, I don't know because I've never been blind, but I think what happens is that, um, you know, your sense of smell and your sense of taste and touch and the way you um, uh, create hope in your mind um, sheds light on a situation that is very difficult to deal with because uh, basically serving a life sentence means that you don't know what's going to happen to you, you know. Um, you might spend virtually the rest of your life in prison. And so I think we all need a, a outlet or a release from that type of frustration and loneliness so that we create our own uh, sense of light through our, our hopes and our dreams and uh, the way we envision things um, to be in the future. Can you talk, to, I mean, you don't have to answer any of this if you don't want to, but can you talk a little bit about those hopes and dreams for you personally? Right. I mean, um, like everybody else, I think you go through stages. Um, for me, coming to prison at uh, such a young age, um, I think it, served as an advantage because uh, I was still open to um, a lot of things and still real curious about um, life and so and and naive in that um, you don't even though you realize that you have a life sentence I don't think that um, being 17, that you can uh, envision the end. So, um, like I said, it, it's a growing process, and in that process, 
in maybe the first um, six or seven years, um, you, you try to, you usually just deal with your surroundings and, and, and the things that are um, happening to you and uh, trying to uh, literally avoid the things that pain you or hurt you. Um, and from that transition, I think you go into a period where um, you begin to realize, you know, uh, the seriousness of the situation. And you begin to try to find ways to, um, to confront that kind of pain and um, that, that period, I guess, lasts for, I guess, depending upon the person. For me, it was like a, probably an eight-year period where um, I tried to find out exactly who I was and, and where I belonged and, and how I uh, fitted into my surroundings. And, um, once I was able to, um, you know, face the, the, the pain of being in prison and the, uh, the consequences of my actions, uh, I was able to uh, get a better grip on myself. And um, because, see, when, in this situation of serving a life sentence, it's like a, a total sense of not having any control over the things that happen to you. And, um, you know, that's frightening. And uh, it's uh, difficult to, to, to overcome that situation. And I think you have to mature some in order to realize that uh, that um, just that outward physical control is not as important as the emotional control um, that you can have over your life. And uh, once you, for me, once I accepted uh, the, those facts ab about, you know, myself, then um, it made me it made it much easier for me to deal with uh, serving the life sentence um, and the consequences of my actions. And after those, I guess, maybe first 10 years of my incarceration, uh, and at the same time, you had a problem of growing up in prison and uh, on the one hand, not a lot of guidance, but on the other hand, uh, a great amount of uh, discipline. And, but uh, the difference in that situation is that um, you get the discipline without the explanation, and uh, you have to learn to deal with, with that, along with all the other problems that you originally came to prison with. Um, immaturity, aggression, things like that. And so uh, for me, it took about 10 years to um, get in touch with uh, myself and my surroundings and, uh, you know, the painful feelings that you have about being incarcerated, realizing that the mistake that you made is one that's irreversible. And in realizing that, it's uh, really painful to um, get in touch with because, you know, it's not like you do something and you can say you're sorry and it goes away. Um, when you reach the reality that um, this act will never, you can never make it better um, so you have to um, come to some type of uh, 
resolve about how you want to deal with that situation. And um, in dealing with that, that part of the incarceration, it's, uh, it's real hard because there are no uh, set rules or set guidelines as to, to how you to, to deal with that type of information. And so it's sort of like you have to um, experiment and, and find ways that will um, not really compensate, but uh, atone for um, the past. And, uh, There's no structure here before you do any of that. Kind of, I mean, you no, so you know you have to create um, your own situations. Um, for me, it was education. Um, I found the more that I learned, the more I learned about myself. And in doing that, um, I found that, you know, I had a, a, a gift for um, educating others. And so for me, uh, I use that tool to um, enhance not only my, my own character, but, you know, my fellow inmates' situations. You told me a little bit about last time, but so I have it on the tape. Tell me a little bit more about what you're doing now. Um, right now, I'm an employee for uh, Penn State University. My uh, title is Student Services Liaison. Um, basically, what I do is uh, I recruit new students inside the um, MA population. I um, tutor them when necessary. I do tutoring. Um, in uh, basic math and uh, English um, to prepare them for a college situation. I uh, find funding um, for inmates and uh, I do a lot of the paperwork for grants and uh, I run, or I'm the chairperson of what they call in, inside Muncie, it's called a task force and what it is, it's made up of other inmates who um, have been elected by their peers to um, oversee the post-secondary education process. And uh, what we do there is we try to structure an associate's degree program that uh, will accommodate uh, a variety of individuals who come into our program at, and who have different levels of education. And so we try to um, find information for those individuals that are leaving the institution and um, find schools for them that, you know, is um, compatible with their needs. And basically, that's what I do. When you, when you look back 24 years, it must be like a dream. I mean, it's like a different person. I mean, can you connect with that person you were then? Or no, it's, it's, it's really strange because when, when I look back, I mean, uh, it doesn't seem like I was involved in, I mean, physically involved in, in the growth of Sharon Wiggins. It, you know, now it's more like I'm looking back on a child, you know, and and, and watching them grow and develop. And I mean, there are some stages in, in that growth that I feel uh, some kinship to. Um, but basically, the person who, who came to prison uh, almost 25 years ago, uh, I have a hard time believing that, you know, I'm that same person. Uh, because the attitudes are so different. But when I think about it, um, I realize now that probably, if it were not for those experiences, um, I would probably not be the person that I am today. So uh, I hold on to, to, 
to that part of my past in order to, to make me recognize, you know, this part of me now. It's, it's like, uh, well, I, know I just try to imagine sometimes something, shape, an event shaping your life so much. I mean, something that happened so long ago has just shaped your life, hasn't it? I mean, it's, yes, it's, I mean, it's just like, you know, when I, I, I think about it and, uh, I'm from an inner city, and uh, a lot of the people that I grew up with are, are in prison or have uh, been here at some, t some point. And uh, I, uh, when I look at them, I'm like, uh, you know, that could be me, you know. Um, and I realize in, in, in one sense I've been real fortunate in that um, the trauma that I created in my life was created at a, a point in time where it was uh, correctable, where I uh, still was uh, naive and uh, very hopeful. And um, had I had to face those type of mistakes um, at 30. Um, I don't know if I would have been so optimistic about uh, what I could do or what I couldn't do. Um, I think the, the best thing about me then was that I didn't realize that I had limits. And so it was easier for me to want to be a school teacher in spite of and more hopeful about how my life could be and what is now the future for me. Um, Have you gone through a midlife crisis in here? I am, well, not really a midlife cr life crisis in that at this stage in my life, I, um, I'm more conscious of, of time. I'm uh, more conscious of uh, being 65 and, and realizing it with a great deal of um, reality mixed in. And yes, I, I guess I do experience at times and, and, and almost in a shocking way because um, you don't, one thing about having a life sentence is that uh, time just sort of stacks up for you. I mean, you don't count the days, and uh, most of the time you don't count the years. So that when I look now at 42 and soon to be 43, I'm like, Phew, you know, all that time has passed and gone. You know, in uh, one sense, I. Uh, I'm realizing it all the time that the time is passing. Um, but in another sense, it's not time that I've actually counted in, in the course of the days or uh, the seasons, but that I am real conscious that all this time has uh, passed in some way for me. If you were the judge in your case, knowing what you know now, what would you, what would you do? I never ask anybody else that question, but it just occurs to me here. Um, I guess I, w I would have done what, what the law required. Um, I'm not so sure that all judges are aware, even in Pennsylvania, that a life sentence means life. If you had a choice, uh, you didn't have to impose a life sentence. And you were the judge in your case. Knowing what you know about your life, what, what would you do? <laughs> Maybe it's not a fair question. Well, know. it probably is. I guess I, I, I can be the get best judge because uh, I know me from the beginning to yeah. the end. You know, I believe that incarceration was necessary for me, that I was out of control, you know, as a teenager. But uh, 
as a judge, I think that I would have been hopeful that this individual could have changed. Mm -hmm. And I think that if barring the life sentence, that uh, I would have tried to take an active um, role in finding out just uh, what happened to this person um, after a certain amount of years, you know, maybe every five years out, you know, would have gotten in touch with someone who, f from the institution who could have shared some light on this person's um, ability to, to um, mature and change. You know, and um, I don't know, I, I, I look at situations that are happening today and um, the, the incident in Florida where it's three teenage kids, I think the youngest is 13 and the oldest is 16. And um, I watch the media's attitude and the general public's attitude about those three young men and I would hope that um, nobody gives up on them. I mean, you know, um, to lock them away forever, you know, um, just probably validates what what is already in their minds that, uh, you know, things are hopeless for them. Mm -hmm. And until somebody encourages those three young individuals and allows them to see that, you know, a change can be made and there are um, some people who do care about them, you know, would probably be the best punishment for them, you know, but just to close them away. And, I mean, what are we saying about children that, you know, you can get, you can be 13 and just shut down and, and never be open to anything again? You know, I, I, I can't believe that. I can't believe that because of my own experience and because in the 25 years that I have been incarcerated, um, I know that there are individuals who, when they come to prison at very young ages, are, I don't like to use the word rehabilitative, but who mature mm -hmm. into a different type of individual. And I, I believe that is the norm rather than, uh, you know, well, you might get 2% of them that will change. I don't believe that. I believe the norm is that when people are in bad situations and have to face themselves, that uh, you find a way to, to uh, in, incorporate your emotions and, and, and your feelings into acceptable behavior. And I think that we all want acceptable behavior. I think it's just that s some of us are just unable because of other situations to to even articulate um, the situation. You know, they know it's a problem. They know it's chaos. They know that they're out of control. But uh, at 13 um, or 16, how can you articulate um, that to any real degree? I mean, for for most teenagers, it's just. Uh, whether it's acne or um, child abuse, it's pain, it's painful. And uh, I don't think they, you know, think it out in, 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 in adult terms. And so they tend to act out. Talk a little bit about the, the situation of women in the system, particularly like in the clemency process. I mean, I've heard people talk about the fact that women just don't get clemency, they don't get approved by the board. I mean, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, I believe statistically in Pennsylvania, uh, if you look uh, in the last 15 years, there's only been 
two clemencies for women. Um, and three all totaled. Um, one of the women was a medical. It was, uh, she was terminally, terminally ill and received clemency. Um, we had woman, one, one woman who was commutated in uh, 1977, and then the last one uh, about three years ago, I guess, about 89, 90. So, um, uh, from time to time we hear from her. She's doing great. She's, well, she's like uh, around 54 years old, and um, she's probably a lot more stable and, you know. Why, what, what's your assessment? Why is that true that women are moving through that? I think that women don't have the type of support systems that men have in Pennsylvania. Um, Such as? Uh, wives or women seem to be more uh, loyal to their spouses, at, at, at least to the point where, you know, if your husband goes to jail or your brother goes to jail, you know, you, you, you try to have some type of support system there for them. You have to understand that the majority of women in prison um, either have committed crimes with their spouses or are in a situation where um, they never were married in, in the first place and didn't have these bonds. And so you put women in a remote area like uh, Muncie, Pennsylvania, when the majority of women are from Pittsburgh and uh, Philadelphia, and you have this three and a half, to, somewhere between three and a half to five and a half hour drive that um, it's not conducive of support either. And uh, so you, you, you lose your link to, com to the community. You know, and if you have to spend um, years upon years in prison, then you're faced with a situation of losing your community altogether because you have to understand that the majority of us do come from inner cities. And, and in the restructuring of inner cities, you have whole communities that no longer exist. And so people get spread around and you don't have that kind of contact. You don't have that kind of support. And so you wind up in a situation where um, you basically are your own support system. Um, I think, too, that women um, don't have the type of, didn't have the type of job opportunities in the first place um, where some men have at least belonged to unions or at least have some type of ser service record. And in having those types of link, not only to the community, but to a working society, then they're more apt to get support from former employers or um, former uh, uh, buddies in the service. And then the whole system of the way uh, men are raised in a situation where um, you have this buddy system where there's um, a, net, a network where men are taught to um, support one another. And on the other hand, you have um, women who come from situations where um, women are taught to be competitive with women. And so therefore, they don't normally um, have the type of bonds um, Th that their male counterparts have. That's, concerning about that. That's kind of interesting because it's, it's contrary to what people on the outside assume about women. They assume that men, that women have close friendships between themselves and men don't a lot of times. And you're kind of saying the opposite in this situation. Right, that, that women are competitive. Uh, you're taught to be competitive at a, a, a very small age. I mean, you know, most women, um, except for a few, um, don't participate in, in, in sports or, or group activities that um, um, encourage uh, uh, some type of uh, close uh, bond or knitting. Um, women are usually, they do uh, separate types of things. Um, most people will say, well, come on, this is 1990, you know. Um, there's been a whole feminist movement 
But what, what most people don't understand is that um, when the majority of time, when you belong to uh, a, a minority or uh, an economic class, uh, you're taught old values. You know, um, you might not always ad ad adhere to those type of values, but they are deeply ingrained in you. And um, those values are not feminist values. You know, um, most women in, in prison believe that, you know, you have a husband and you have one man and, and that is your life, you know, regardless of the situation. And um, I know there are a lot of people that would say, come on, <laughs> you know, don't they read books? Well, you know, you're in a situation where, no, they didn't have time to read books and they didn't have time to be informed because they were um, struggling for survival. And so some of the, th the things that um, might change for women don't exist for most women in prison. Are there, uh, are there differences in the kind of programs available here, do you think, between men and women? Like you, here you want to go to an AA degree, right? And then greater prison you can get a right. bachelor's degree. Right. You want to go well, to you have to understand that in, in, in the prison system, um, the parole board is, is, is mainly male-oriented. Um, the Bureau of Correction is mainly male-oriented. And so over, you know, the last uh, 10 years, it's changed somewhat. Um, now they have uh, incorporated in the last 10 years what they call um, non-traditional uh, types of education in carpentry, um, electronics. But those are things that only happen in the last 10 years. And then you have to understand that you are introducing uh, these non-traditional uh, vocations to women who have still uh, a traditional thought pattern, you know, yeah. so that if you, you don't remember that these women still come from backgrounds that say it is not feminine to uh, take on these types of jobs that a man has a specific place in life as a woman has a specific place in life. And you take these two, th two, two values and try to um, incorporate uh, an education for a woman as uh, non-traditional, you know, you're not only gonna get, have uh, a problem in trying to uh, assimilate her into this program because she already has an attitude about uh, a woman who's a carpenter or a truck driver, you know, and, and, and so in the last 10 years, it's been a, a slow and gradual process. And then you have to understand that even though these programs are offered in this institution, they're in a limited number so that, you know, you have a population close to 1,000, but maybe 20 spots in five, di you know, five different sections and uh, you need a certain type of education, you have to be a high school graduate. Uh, a lot of these women uh, coming to prison aren't high school graduates, so they have to go through the whole process of uh, education and getting that high school diploma and then being involved in that program, while at the same time uh, worrying about children that they have in the streets and responsibilities that they have out there. And so it's really, uh, a difficult thing to do in prison. Let me ask you a question. Uh, we were talking last night after the class last week. We got talking about this. Do you think the public looks differently on women who are killed than on men? Like, I wonder if there's a kind of prejudice against women. I, who have, have, you know what I mean? I, I yes, I, I believe that um, there are. Uh, probably a decidedly large group of individuals who, women, who probably don't even know that women exist in prison in the numbers that they exist in. And so you have a downside there where you don't have a lot of organizations, female organizations, who come into to the institution. 
because um, if you hear a statistic on TV and they say, well, you know, in Pennsylvania there's uh, 60,000 uh, prisoners and only 1% are women, you know what I'm saying? You're not calculating. Yeah. So you believe that that's a very small proportion and they're probably getting, getting treated fairly. You know, <laughs> it's too, it's, the number is so small that you couldn't possibly discriminate against them. On the other hand, I, I believe that you have men who basically have uh, a set idea about what women should be and what they should do. And when women are outside of, of the norms that uh, these men have created who are in power, then it's like a double whammy because you've disappointed them. And, 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 and they can't even imagine a situation that would cause a woman to uh, participate in, 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 in violence or in uh, any criminal activity because, you know, women can look to men to get help, <laughs> you know. They shouldn't have to go out in the street and, and steal or rob. And I think it's that attitude um, that prevents uh, a lot of women from even being released. I don't believe that women in general, um, not just serving a life sentence, but across the board, are paroled as soon as their male counterparts, or even at, in some instances, their male co-defendants. Yeah. And I believe it's because it's that structure, you know, that when uh, a parole board or commutation board looks and men are accepted, their, their violence is accepted. You know, to be a man, you fight back. You, you know, you're aggressive. You, you, you know, you plunge in and you, you're assertive about um, your future. And so therefore, it's understandable that a man would steal for his family. You know, it's understandable that a man would push and shove to um, get his point across. When he, when he believes that, you know, he's being attacked. But it's not excusable for a woman in that same situation to steal for her children. Which goes back to our stereotypes and all of that. Right. But I wonder if there's some male fears or something like, you know, we're, sure. we're not afraid of violence, but we're, we expect it, like you say, out of men. But I wonder if there's some kind of um, fear that we, unspoken fear that we have of women who are violent. That we, Here's a situation. I watched uh, 2020. And um, they had a show on there, and this woman who, uh, her boyfriend, she committed this act of violence against him, and she castrated him. And in uh, the female news reporter, in her version of this situation, and when she talked about violence, um, she talked about violence and about it being wrong. When the men reporters talked about it, they talked about it as uh, in a different stream. It was almost as if this was some kind of perverted, terrible act. And they were, the impression was that they were personally affronted by what she did. I've seen these same reporters talk about rape and, and, and those instances of violence. And to them, it's violence. And, you know, it, but it's normal violence. And it was just amazing how, and even Barbara Walters corrected him when she said, you know, it's, it's obvious that we, we see the situation differently, you know. And it, it, it sort of gave that. You know. Wow. Well, I'll take a picture of her along here. Let me ask you if I have any other questions. I haven't asked them. I haven't even gotten to my list yet. Uh, but if you, if you had a magic lantern, you rubbed it and the genie came out, well, what would give you one wish? What would you do? I think I changed the day of my arrest. What did you do to it? I 
I think that I would have me going to school instead of. And then when I think about it, maybe that wouldn't have changed the events. It might have just changed the time. Maybe it would be better for if I said a better solution to that problem would have, would probably be that I would have gotten some help before the day that uh, my crime occurred. And probably the likelihood of that happening in that situation probably wouldn't have occurred. No. I could ask a question live and you're really about it. No, that's... Does it? Does it.